It's hard to claim that we live in an oppressive patriarchy where men are devalued and ignored in education, the workplace, the media and in society as a whole. Half of all women and girls' problems is men. Angry men, abusive men, scared men, confused men. It's not just the raging feminists shaming men and dismissing their concerns, but now it is the general sentiment of society. I am your mother, I am your mother. you listen to me, you listen to me. Stop all that mansplaining, no one's listening I'd rather die than hook up with another straight white guy Men are seen as worthless and when they try to stand up for themselves they are gaslit into silence and branded as a misogynist My name is Jess Gill and I wanted to find out how we got into this mess and if masculinity is as bad as society portrays it to be Join me in this journey as I interview a range of perspectives to find out what masculinity means in 2023 and how we've led to the abolition of men. It's not shocking that these men feel morally castrated because what, what are men good for? Our culture has become very feminised in many ways. I think a lot of men are confused about what it is that they want. Earlier this year, I asked woke Londoners, what are men good for? What are women good for? Everything. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> what are men good for? Nothing. <laughs> Do you think men are important in society? Well, I guess... Um, I guess what um, what traditionally defines men, you know, the the traditionally masculine areas of what um, what people do. I think some of that may be important in society, but I think it's probably been overly prioritised in society. Like the masculine way of dealing with things is often more aggressive and more kind of, you know, uh, where. Uh, do you think it's a bad thing? I think it, of, it often is a bad thing. I think it can be a bad thing. And I think probably uh, we need less of it. We need a, a somewhat more traditionally feminine approach to quite a lot of the problems we have in the world. This received millions of views and thousands of comments. Along with the rest of the internet, this really opened my eyes to how prevalent and mainstream misandry has become in our society. When a man can't justify his own self-worth, what does this say about how society treats him? In order to get to the bottom of this, I went to Swindon to ask Connor Tomlinson, a host of the podcast The Lotus Heaters, to get his perspective of how we've gotten into this situation. What criteria allows him to feel important? What allows him to justify looking himself in the mirror in the morning when every structure, the economy, uh, dating market, they are planning men's obsolescence? If they're automating most jobs, uh, men, men do the overwhelming number of dangerous jobs, but if, if they replace those with robots, okay, men are functionally useless. They've replaced warfare with robots, as, as we've already said. Um, they've replaced sex now with AI, pornography, and eventually robots. So we're just going to be stratified unisex consumers existing in isolation. And if then the cultural messaging is ubiquitously girl boss, then men aren't valued even on a subjective sentimental level. And how do you value a man as a man, for, for lots of men, if you've never known one in your own household? Fatherlessness is rampant. Now, 50 percent of kids in the UK grow up between two households now. I mean, not just immigration, that's a stress on housing crisis as is. But the reason is people having kids out of wedlock and divorce rates, and some of them just never know their dad. So how are you meant to have that, that mental figure in your life that instills in you a subjective reverence? for masculinity and knowing what you can grow into. So it's not shocking that these men feel morally castrated because what 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 are men good for? Like what what do they have to do to feel vindicated in and of themselves that they feel like they have a purpose? It's it's actually a, a fair thing to be confused about. While the advancements of women in the workplace and in education is seen as a positive for society, the fact that men are struggling isn't met with the same attention. Just look at the education gap, where female students are performing better than male students, yet despite male students falling behind, this is seen as an achievement and something to be celebrated. Female students are given quotas and female-only opportunities in an education system that already benefits them, yet male students are ignored and underperformance is celebrated. 
In order to understand the elevation of women and discouragement of men in the workforce, I asked Nina Power, author of the book, What Do Men Want? Thank you so much for agreeing to be interviewed, Nina. I was wondering if you could go into more detail about how we've gotten into this situation. Our culture has become very feminised in many ways. The kind of work that is valued, the kind of work that is um, encouraged in these kind of post-industrial societies, it is typically plays upon female strengths in terms of speaking, in terms of interpersonal relationships. It tends not to be so uh, physical. You know, there's a lot of discussion today about whether education in the workplace is in fact um, become too feminized in, in certain key regards. Um, and it seems to be a kind of symptom and a function of particular this particular economy and the direction of travel that the West in particular has chosen to take. Since the Industrial Revolution, we have seen a shift towards men and women becoming more and more interchangeable when it comes to the ability to perform most labour. So rather than a division of labour based on, on sex, we now have a kind of more neutral subject which is sort of indifferent to sex. You know, of course, sex still matters when it comes to certain key things. Um, obviously, uh, pregnancy and birth would be an obvious one, sort of female reproduction is very different from male reproduction. But the economy in general seems to sort of suggest or pretend that there aren't really any meaningful differences, except at the extremes, you know, so men still dominate in the most dangerous jobs, you know, if you're working on an oil rig, for example, you know, these these jobs tend to be still done by men, but they're not really often noted or recognized in a certain way, because our culture seeks to val valorize, I would say, things that again are more feminized. So even to the extent of celebrating victimhood, um, as we saw with, with Me Too, and again, this is not to say that there aren't genuine instances of um, abuse or harm, there clearly are, but in the broader shift, social shifts that we see, um, a lot of the values that are being recognized are female or feminized in many, many ways. It's very difficult to know when to call yourself a man if you aren't a dad yet, if you aren't in that kind of vocation, and if you aren't constantly proximate to danger. Like, this is something that the, the debanking of gun clubs that is going on recently is, is really heinous. And it's also the, the unisexing of the scout groups and things like that. If men aren't capable of being close to dangerous phenomena with a mentor figure guiding them through how to handle it properly and incorporate it into their lives, so that then they aren't afraid when a crisis strikes and they can defend the people that look to them as a man of last resort. How do you know if you're a man? And, and, and this is why the, there's, there's been a bit of a jokey meme passed around by the, the tech skeptic reactionaries. And that is the atomic bomb cucked us all. Like the First and Second World Wars were utterly brutal. Trench warfare is horrific. But there is something mythologically heroic about a sword fight. It's gotten to the point now where, where violence has been so bureaucratized by a, by a bump note bureaucracy the, the, the devouring mother institution that comes along and, and, and castrates a, a son of, of their potential by smothering them in safety. That if you have a fight in a primary school, and this happened to me constantly, if you had a fight as a kid and you weren't the aggressor, you were punished for retaliating. Just any violence at all is pathological. And now it feels like we're in a stifling culture. And this is where censorship has come from. This is why Jordan Peterson, Freya India, the likes have, have called this a form of female totalitarianism. Speech policing and behavioral nagging is the new totalitarianism. And, and that's because we have been revoked of, particularly men, our ability to just have a fist fight and sort it out between ourselves. Now, all competition and all conflict is covert and snidey and sniping. And it's all done behind keyboards. And it's just pathetic. Not only are men devalued, but the values men hold have been undermined and demonized. Braveness, stoicism, leadership, strength, ambition, being a protector and a provider. Society has deconstructed what it means to be a man. Branding masculinity is toxic and offering men nothing to replace it with. To quote C.S. Lewis, we make men without chests and expect of them virtue and enterprise. To properly understand the value society is projecting onto men, I spoke with Manchester mayoral candidate Nick Buckley, who has a history of working with the homeless who are disproportionately men. It's really great to speak to you, Nick. The main question I wanted to ask you is why do you think men have become so weak? Why are men weak? That's a great question. Part of the answer is there's no reward anymore now to be brave, to take a chance. You're more likely to have that opportunity now become a negative if you try to do something brave. Our men used to be brave. They were the soldiers, the warriors, the providers 
They would hunt the elephants. They would go to war. They would explore new lands. And that made sure their children and their family were successful as well. And even if they died doing those things, their names would live on. They would be worshipped, they'd be hailed as heroes. And boys would see that and sing those songs. And those boys would want to be brave as well when they grew up. That's what bravery was about, protecting the tribe and being the best leader you possibly can. But that doesn't exist anymore. And why does that exist? We become over feminized. Men now are just inferior versions of women. And who wants an inferior version of anything? Starts now state education. Designed by women, run by women for the benefit of females. If you're a boy now, be quiet, sit down. Why can't you be more like the girls? Well, I can't be like the girls. I'm a boy. And I want to be a boy. And I will be loud and I will run around. And I will pretend to shoot people and fight dinosaurs. I don't want to read Wuthering Heights. I want to read a comic where I shoot something in the face because it's a green monster attacking the city. That's what boys need to do because that feeds into their innate role of being providers and protectors. Both masculinity and femininity can be both positive and negative. Yet why is masculinity disproportionately presented as a bad thing? Over the past decades, we've seen a rise of men relating to movies like American Psycho, Fight Club and Joker. It may seem concerning to some that so many men are relating to movies where the protagonists are violent and unhinged. However, these movies simply represent extreme examples of what men experience on a day-to-day -day basis, with the pressures of conformity and society providing men with nothing to fight, nothing to overcome and nothing to explore. But what does this actually mean to be a man? And what do men actually want? Is masculinity simply about getting laid with a different woman and having fancy cars and a big mansion like the Sigma male community suggests? Or is there more to it than that? To find out, I asked the writer and podcaster, Chris Williamson. Thank you for agreeing to do this interview, Chris. So my first question is, what do you think men actually want? I think a lot of men are confused about what it is that they want now. I think that they have this sense that they want liberation, freedom, agency, sovereignty over the type of people and the type of life that they lead. And I don't think that they feel like they've got that. But a lot of the roles and archetypes that men previously would have taken pride in, that of being a protector, a provider, a procreator, a lot of those have been um, eroded over the last few years, which means that they're now scrabbling around trying to find not only uh, how can I feel fulfilled, but what does fulfillment even look like? Do you think men should man up? I do think that it's a good piece of advice to tell men to man up, but not necessarily in the way that it's often taken. This doesn't mean ignoring your emotions. It doesn't mean detaching yourself from the way that you feel or from the people that are around you or becoming a lone ranger, sigma grind set male. It means transcending and including your emotions. It means opening up to your friends and the people that are close to you. That to me is what genuinely manning up means. But we do have to concede that ostensibly life has never been more convenient and more comfortable. You know, you could have been born 500 years ago and died of dysentery at age 12. You could have been born in the middle of some horrible civil war and been not you, you wouldn't have even been as noble to have been decapitated you were poked to hole holes were poked in you and you were left to die in a bloody field a lot of men are struggling at the moment because they don't have any of the glory that they would have seen in previous days which i don't think was actually there i think a lot of men's experiences throughout history was really really brutal but they also don't have access to be able to tap into their emotions too. I wanted to explore this further, so I asked the political commentator, Charlie Downs. Till I was probably 18 years old, probably until I went to university, I didn't really, I had never really thought about the concept of masculinity. It was not something that ever really crossed my mind. Um, obviously I'd heard the word, but it was not something, I didn't think it was anything that would be of value to me. Um, but it was only when I, as I say, went to university um, and I was living by myself, I came to realise, and it seems like a basic thing, you can't just do what you want all the time. Sometimes you do actually have to do things that you don't want to do. And that's what duty fundamentally is. And whether that's a kind of personal duty, like, for example, taking care of yourself physically, um, learning how to defend yourself and so on, which I think are um, essential masculine uh, attributes, 
or a more general um, sense of duty to those around you. Um, and again, that sounds very basic, but actually the modern world doesn't teach us these things. I mean, you know, my parents were tr are traditional people, um, but it's difficult to escape the malaise of the modern world that does view hedonism and self-interest as being the only things worth pursuing. Despite what the radical feminists or the manosphere like to suggest, masculinity is more about short-term hedonistic and materialistic goals. Take the Ryan Gosling movies Drive or Blade Runner 2049, about isolated men who not only feel lonely but lost in a world and trying to find purpose within it. I also wanted to ask you whether you think men are getting good advice from the mainstream media. Are men getting good advice? Largely, no. I don't think so. I think most of mainstream media's advice to men tells them that they would be better if they just started acting more like women. In fact, the only acceptable, publicly acceptable versions of masculinity that seem to be put out there look an awful lot like stereotypical femininity. And, and men are kind of, they get the finger pointed at them and it says, if you were just less masculine, all of your problems would go away. Masculinity has been demonized all my life and I'm 55. It starts off with these new phrases, toxic masculinity. You know, what, what's toxic masculinity? There's no such thing as toxic masculinity. Masculinity is wonderful. Masculinity conquered nature and the elements, created society created our modern world. That's what masculinity did. Nothing toxic about it. As the proverb goes, the child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. We have a, a cohort of dispossessed men who have been dislocated by industry, alienated by the sexual revolution, unable to participate in dating apps, and also years and years ago, they probably would have died for a noble cause. And so we have to figure out what do we do with those men? Well, either women abandon the sexual revolution and settle down with them and have nice families and have a happy life, or they go into some kind of vocation. And we've lost both of them. So why do you think we have incels? Well, there you have it. I think Andrew Tate is a, a symptom of a culture in many ways. Um, he, he represents all of the things that young men in particular are not supposed to be and not supposed to like. So he is taboo and as such is attractive for that reason because the moment people say well you can't say this you can't talk about that then you make those things attractive i think andrew tate is a is a symptom of a very materialistic culture but it's also a very hypocritical culture because our culture tells us that we should be sexual agents you know everything is about sex but at the same time if you get it wrong if you make a mistake uh, particularly if you're a man then you can be cancelled, you know, you deserve to be shamed and so on. So there are all of these like liberal contradictions or antagonisms um, in the culture. And I think Andrew Tate just sort of drives a truck through those, I mean, and says, well, okay, um, we live in a, a sex obsessed culture, fine, I'm going to have loads of uh, defend polygamy and um, and I don't actually think it's what most men want. I think most men would prefer monogamy they would prefer to have a wife and family and so on and actually be dedicated and loyal um, and committed um, and i think that's often been kind of blocked off for young people today young men in particular which goes to the heart of the incel question i think we've always had incels if you see what i mean which are basically young men who are for one reason or another dispossessed of um, a certain relation to the world to uh, you know a certain attitude towards the social world feel alienated from it desperately want to be loved um and so on and, and none of these things are are negative i think what becomes negative is when people feel so alienated that their only option is one of destruction if they if that's how they feel you know where where people become turned away from the world um, and not just uh, absent from it, but really uh, take up a kind of um, destructive and nihilistic attitude. And I think the whole point would be to avoid people falling into that situation. So again, this kind of demonization of young men for, for essentially wanting to be loved, um, which is extremely human desire. Um, and then to categorize 
these men in a certain way and to sort of demonize them. And again, it's it's always about giving people a group that they're allowed to hate, you know, because if you say, oh, well, incels hate women and that's bad, um, but you're allowed to hate in incels, then your hate is uh, given license and permission. And this is how elites have always uh, divided people. So it's just that in the past few years, um, these are the new objects uh, or groups that you're allowed to hate. You're allowed to hate white men, you're allowed to hate men who want to have a girlfriend, um, and so on and so forth. He not only tells men that they are worthless, but forbids them from talking about it. No wonder so many men go to the likes of Andrew Tate. Andrew Tate and the other Manosphere influencers simply provide a shell of masculinity, which isn't realistic to the real world. Their content often resorts to the same tactics as the left, demonising the other gender based on stereotypes and acting as if we're in the oppression Olympics. This is not the solution and this just creates more resentful men. We need to realise that society needs strong men as much as strong men need society. Have you got what it takes to be a reasoned presenter? Well, send us a short clip of yourself to join at reasoned.uk and we might be seeing you on this very channel very soon indeed.